що ж ми починаємо. Це другого подіння, другого дня, М17 Артфорд. І зараз з нами на зв'язку Андерс Петерс. І Андерс якраз буде говорити про майбутнє мистецького колекціонування, нові моделі та мотиви. І декілька слів про нашого спікера. Андерс Петерс – провідний спеціаліст дослідження арт-ринку. Засновник та виконавчий директор арт-тактик лондонської компанії відповідного профілу. Читаю про селекцію мистецтва і класа хвилі в Інституті культури Солоту, Смотрі і Таркісна школа в Лондоні і Парижі. Є член управління виробникової організації професійного правила міжнародного художнього ринку. За ініціативу Петерсона у співпраці з Артактів виходять такі важливі для арт-індустрії видання, як Фіско Омен Арти Рекорд, Неджер Артіс Глобал Рекорд, Дефав Артіл Менес. Тобто, з нами на зв'язку, як я вже писала, спеціаліст і аналітер на одному світового рівня. І я вітаю Андерса і прохожу на англійську мову. Hello, hello Anders. Hi Natalie. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, thank you for uh, participation in our forum. We all ears for your uh, presentation and for your talk. So the format is that first we are listening to you and after the, we have a Q&A session from, I have some questions, of course, and our audience and guests, uh, they I'm sure will have a lot of questions after your talk. So please, your, your time. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much and um, welcome everyone. Um, hello to Kiev. I'm sitting here in London at the moment, in sunny London, which is uh, unusual. Um, I uh, Let me just kind of share my screen so I can uh, make sure we see the presentation and then... Uh, is this uh, visible? Yes, yes, we'll see. You can see it? Yes. Fantastic. Great. Um, so I guess the purpose is so we'll spend probably about, I don't know, 45 minutes, 50 minutes or something, um, talking a little bit about the title, which is the future of art collecting and particularly looking at new models and new motivations. Um, I want to, I, I know uh, Natalie probably, uh, I guess it, it I also understood there was an introduction, so but I'll talk a little bit about myself and a little bit where we come from, if that's okay. Um, so I started the company in uh, 2001 here in London. Um, I came from a financial background. <clears throat> so I used to work for uh, one of the American banks, JP Morgan, here in London uh, for six years uh, from the mid 90s to the late uh, 2000s. Uh, and I guess you might still think, you know, why this big leap from finance to art? And in, in my case, it was a kind of a a mix of a uh, hybrid interest. On one hand, it was the interest in contemporary art from a personal point of view and my data analytics that was really coming from my more financial oriented, um, both academic as well as, as um, working background. Um, and when we started in 2001, we really wanted to try to figure out if research and data could be something that could help uh, anyone involved in the art world uh, in terms of navigating and hopefully making more informed decisions regarding um, you know, whatever they want to do, whether it was buying art or collecting art or setting up businesses. So our business model has always been um, a, a bespoke um, and a kind of a, I would say bespoke research, um, gathering and collecting data about almost every aspect of the art market. I mean, you see here on the right, a report, which is the Art and Philanthropy Report, um, which is an initiative that we launched about two years, three years ago now, uh, looking at the intersection between art and philanthropy and patronage. So not necessarily the consumption of art, not buying art, not investing in art, but how uh, philanthropy, how we could support art and arts organizations, artists, and various models around the world that is being developed around this. So we are we're interested in virtually everything that is the cross-section between art and something else. And today is really to talk about, I guess, the, the 
uh, it's the art world, but also the consumers, the, the, the collectors, um, whether these are young collectors, uh, new collectors, uh, people who want to become collectors, um, is really to try to get a sort of a sense of many of the changes that we have seen over the last 10 years um, with regards to this. And um, obviously, we all, uh, many of us still are in the midst of a pandemic. Uh, some restrictions has been lifted in certain parts of the world. Others are still uh, suffering from lockdowns, etc. cetera. But um, what this particular period, I want to look at it because it has become almost like an experiment. It's become a um, the amount of innovation that I hopefully will convey to you a bit later uh, will give you some sense of how much uh, change, how much innovation has taken place within the last 18 months, um, which I think sets a kind of a precedence uh, for what we might expect in the future. Um, in terms of, uh, I guess, the people that we work with is a, as a, is a very broad set of um, clients from kind of the banking sector to insurance, to collectors, galleries, auction houses, uh, and anyone really who operates either within the art world as a business or is thinking about entering the art world. It could be um, people within uh, human resources and recruitment. It could be uh, other types of brands that are looking at building a uh, presence within the art world. All these are kind of stakeholders that we work with. In terms of reports, we produce um, and we have a website uh, where we regularly publish uh, reports uh, virtually every week. There's a new report coming out. Here's just a few examples of some of the markets that we're covering. The online market uh, through a partnership that we have had with uh, Hiscox Insurance Company uh, in London. Uh, the art and finance report that we're doing with Deloitte, um, which is now in its 10th year. Uh, we're launching the next edition in the autumn this year. And this is a report that is looking at the um, intersection between art and wealth management. Um, and the final report here you see is a report regarding NFTs, uh, which is something I'm going to talk a little bit about towards the end of today. And some of you might be, have probably come across the, the there's a whole notion about non-fungible tokens or NFTs. And we initiated our first report um, on this market in May this year. So um, it's, it's, a new, it's a new research project, but hopefully one that uh, I think is going to be very interesting to follow going forward. So let us kind of, I guess, is maybe try to give a little bit of background to why are we sitting here today and, and I guess talking about issues around collecting and new collecting models. Um, I want to go a step, step a little bit back and, and I guess look at what has happened to the art market um, over the last, well, let's say two decades, the two decades that we have been studying it. Um, and there are kind of four key drivers to the change that we have been seeing over these years. Um, first, there's been a global wealth creation, um, which is uh, you know, not only Europe, uh, US, but increasingly also Asia, Middle East, um, and, and other places in Latin America and other places of the world, where um, we're starting to see more people with more disposable income. Uh, this has led also to people looking at um, the more financial aspects of, uh, of art in, art buying or art buying art in general. Um, it's not only about passion, it's also about the financial aspects and the value associated with art, which is, I think, it's something that has changed radically over the last 20 years. Um, this obviously art has always had a value and there's been people buying and selling art for profit purposes. But I think what we've seen in the particular in the last 10 years is an, is an increasing financialization of the art market that um, I think it's a trend that probably not gonna stop, but it's also an interesting trend to look further into because what, what implications that might have for the future. Um, so wealth is, like, I would say, it's almost a fuel. Is that what, without wealth, I think we wouldn't have an art market that we have today, but it wouldn't be, it's not the sole factor. And I think the other factor which is really important is this whole thing about the global infrastructure. Uh, the fact that we have seen a radical, you know, an exponential expansion in physical infrastructure in particular uh, over the last 20 years. And the number of art fairs, biennials across the world, galleries and auction houses, museums and art centers, all of these things are creating an, an infrastructure, allowing people to engage with art 
uh, in places that maybe had no opportunity to do so in the past. So the combination of wealth together with a much larger marketplace, both commercial and non-commercial, has enabled the market to kind of, I guess, be in a position where it is today. However, on the same time, this global market infrastructure that we're talking about, which is a very much a physical events-based infrastructure, is also something that has been uh, challenging for the art market, particularly during the last 18 months. Um, art fairs, biannuals, exhibitions has been cancelled or postponed. Social restrictions has been imposed on audiences in terms of visitors and so forth, which meant that the art world, in the very particularly in the first six seven months of from I would say from March last year till September October and actually also into this year, has found it very difficult to operate. Uh, you, you know, using the more traditional channels. Um, but what that's kind of, I guess, that particular challenge led to another interesting, and I think something that has also changed probably the art market um, forever, is the adoption of technology and the growth of uh, online businesses, the uh, adaption of different types of technologies that maybe in the past was seen as um, almost sort of science fiction type of thing, whether that's virtual reality or augmented reality, these things are now becoming more and more common, uh, allowing people to uh, have digital experiences, new type of digital experiences. Um, and, and the online sales that we will see later on has been an incredibly efficient channel for auction houses and galleries and others to uh, at least reduce some of the losses that they were facing as a result of the physical infrastructure not being able to work as it's supposed to. Um, uh, hopefully, we will revert to a bit of normality. Um, we're coming into an autumn where uh, hopefully the main art fairs in Switzerland, such as Art Basel, Freeze Art Fair here in London, etc., will um, will go ahead and probably under certain restrictions, but at least that we will go back, revert back to some kind of normality. It's very. Um, uh, it's very nice to see. I can see a uh, uh, an image here of, of actually a room with audiences, which uh, I don't think I have experienced. I've been sitting in front of a Zoom for now 18 months, not seeing live audiences. I think it's great to actually to see here um, a conference where there are actually people in in um, in in person being in the room. So, uh, so hopefully we will revert to that. But that doesn't mean I think that we are going to be uh, fully back to normal. I don't think. I think. Is what we call the new normal. And I think the new normal is really a hybrid version of uh, the traditional or the physical as we used to know it, as well as the uh, technology and the digital experiences that has been particularly created, um, I would say, during the last 18 months. The final thing, um, which I kind of mentioned with regards to collective base and why people buy is this whole notion about art as an asset class. So this is art as in, and not necessarily as an investment, but something that has value, that stores value, that people are using, for example, for diversification purposes. So they are um, having many types of uh, different types of wealth. They might have property, they might have a financial wealth, they might have uh, art and collectible wealth as part of this. Um, and this is a kind of a, a domain which we have been very involved with um, for the last 10 years in particular through the uh, partnership I mentioned with Deloitte earlier. And um, what we are seeing now is that there is an increasing um, overlap, I think, between the kind of financial services industry and also the art professionals that operate. And this is a very exciting relationship, not uh, not without its friction. Um, we're dealing with, of course, the financial world is a heavily regulated world and the art world is rather unregulated in many aspects. Um, and the two, um, the, two, the, the two stakeholders, the art world and the finance world, are and have been for a long time trying to find out a compromise for how to work together. But I think uh, everything is moving forward in the right direction. Um, and I think this year's um, report that will come out later this year will demonstrate that there is also this undercurrent of thinking about art, not only as a cultural or an aesthetic or an historic object, uh, but also as a financial um, 
uh, if not object, but a financial aspect of, of this. And I'm going to talk a little bit about this later today. What that, what does that mean? Uh, because it is not only about, as I said, investment. It's not about necessarily making money out of art. It's protecting really the value that art contains. So the art, what, what, what is, um, what something is worth. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the kind of services that's being built around it, almost like a, ecosystem being built around this whole notion about art as an asset class. So if you look at the kind of the market where, and this is taking, just giving you a sense of how the market has changed from early 2000 or 2000 up till um, uh, last year. And um, you can see that they, despite obviously what happened and the, the downturn that the market faced as a result of COVID-19, um, you can see that the market has changed radically in terms of its size uh, and also its uh, structure. Um, these are sales only really looking at Christmas and Sotheby's. So this is what we will define as the premium end of the market. Uh, these are the sort of top luxury end of the art market. Obviously, the market is much bigger than what these graphs are, um, are showing, but it gives you a sense, first of all, of the growth, uh, the composition, and also the kind of cyclicality in the market that we have seen over the last 20 years. Um, and I think there's something very interesting. Uh, we just published a report um, yesterday, which took the first half of 2020 and uh, sorry 2021 and the uh, the market has uh, bounced back basically to pre-pandemic levels so already this the uh, the, um, the the sales has taken place up until now uh, basically up until end of june uh, ex uh, exceeds the levels that we saw in 2019 so prior to the pandemic and i think there's there's something here is that the art market has this intrinsic quality at the moment of bouncing back. We saw the same thing. If you look at this graph in 2009, the market was suffering, obviously, as a result of the financial crisis, but bounced back a year after, virtually back to the same level. And we see the same thing again. And I think these things are, uh, there are many reasons, I guess. First of all, uh, the way that the art world adapted to the crisis, I think, much more um, much more adaptable than many other industries has been. Um, I think there's also been a pent up of demand among collectors that now suddenly is being, um, that energy is being put back into the market and people are buying. We're also starting to see a geographical shift in the market as a whole, where buyers are now coming out of places like Hong Kong and China and other parts of Asia. And uh, Hong Kong and Asia is now becoming the strategically the second largest market for Christie's and Sotheby's and Phillips, which are the sort of three major international auction houses. So there is a shift in geographical focus. There's a shift in preferences and taste. As you can see here, contemporary accounts for the lion's share or the largest share of the market. Um, this is partly due to the fact that uh, the more historic categories often lack um, supply, or basically meaning that there is not that many incredibly valuable works of old masters coming regularly to, to the market. Um, we obviously had a few years back these Salvatore Mundi by Da Vinci that was sold for 450 million, but these occasions happened very rarely. Uh, so the typical thing that we've seen over the last, I would say, 10 years is that the market is increasingly gravitating towards contemporary art. Uh, it's an art form where, first of all, I think a lot of collectors likes to identify with art made by artists of their same generation uh, or a similar generation. And, this, and the, uh, on top of that, um, it's the fact that there is a uh, much larger availability of work. And I think this is sort of... Um, plays particularly to those people who are interested in uh, maybe more the kind of opportunistic investment aspect of buying art is that contemporary often provides you with ingredients um, that is make it possible to actually think about um, art more as an investment. It's slightly counterintuitive because you would think that rarity 
it's more important. The fact that something, you know, is not uh, reproduced or made in, in thousands of, 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 of uh, versions. You would think that if you had one that would, you know, if you were the only one who owned something, that would be hugely valuable. And to a certain extent, that's true. But it's very difficult to create markets around objects where there's very few, because they typically will be bought by someone and it will be held by that individual uh, for a long period of time before it then enters back to the market again. So these, these kind of dynamic that we're currently seeing, it's a uh, result of uh, changing consumers, younger consumers, different consumers, more financially oriented consumers, and now increasingly also consumers coming from other parts of the world, particularly Asia, uh, with both mainland China and Hong Kong and other parts of, of Asia being the kind of the dominant force. Um, so those are the kind of the global, more kind of macro pictures for where we are now, now and what, what's happening. When it comes to online sales, I think it's important also to see that virtually online sales has been a relatively small part of the art market up until last year. Online sales really uh, accounted for, you know, we, we estimated the market to be about $4.8 billion uh, in 2019. Growth rates in this market has been coming down year on year. Um, and it was a kind of almost that the art market really didn't fully believe in the um, opportunity to kind of grow online sales. It was always seen as secondary. It was something that if an auction house had a choice of doing a physical auction versus doing an online auction, they will always do a physical auction. And they will typically put maybe less important paintings, sculptures, other works of art in the online sales. Now, what happened during the, um, the pandemic itself was that this changed radically. Um, and as I said before, it, did ha it had to change because there was no way you could conduct a physical auction because the auction were not allowed to um, have any people in the room and no physical bidding. So you needed to kind of adopt the, uh, the online sales platforms. So if you look at the jump in online sales between 219 and 220, you could see that, and these are just looking at what we call online only sales. Online only sales are basically where there's no auctioneer, there's no uh, opportunity to be present physically in the room to bid. It's virtually just click and bid, click and buy. Uh, and um, the online sales reached close to just over a billion in 2020, up from about 160, 170 uh, million the year before. So we saw a, a really radical change, a really... Um, uh, I think I don't think I, I've been we've been studying the market for 20 years and I've never really seen anything like it in terms of um, going from one mode to something else. I'm just going to go back to this one. And I thought the quite because when I saw the image on the left is uh, Sotheby's um, uh, head of contemporary, um, Oliver Barker, standing in front of multiple screens of other uh, experts and specialists in different locations in the world. Um, and it reminded me almost when I watched that sale, it was almost like a kind of a Star Wars experience. It was, I thought, God, you know, something is changing. Something is radically changing in the art world. And it did. And I think this is really what is happening right now is that the art world has gone through, I would say it's a systemic change or a transformational stage that I think we will never, we're never going to return back to what we saw before. I mean, when I say not going to return, it does not mean that we're not going to return back to physical exhibitions and physical activities, but the online aspect has now reached a new level, which I think if anything, the auction houses, galleries will adopt these practices and make it part and make it probably even better than it currently is. And we saw also, again, the first half of this year, uh, online only sales didn't grow or didn't grow at the, with the same pace as we saw between 219 and 220, but still saw around 70% increase on last year. So there's clearly uh, an opportunity that is now being seized by the art world when it comes to adopting digital 
And I think this is now have the opportunity to do a lot of very interesting things when it comes to building audiences, when it comes to reach out to people that maybe otherwise would not have been part of the art market, that may be finding the traditional art market uh, intimidating, difficult to understand, and now are suddenly given a, a digital interface to deal with this market uh, with more information, with um, less necessarily personal contact, but by having a number of other tools, uh, allowing them to kind of create that trust uh, between the seller and the buyer. I'm going to look a little bit uh, regarding this because this journey, what we call the consumer journey, is far from perfect and there's still a lot of friction. But, you know, we've come a very long way from where we've been in the past. The sales was one thing. The other thing is what we call uh, average prices. And we can see how much average prices has changed from 219 to 220. And actually, this, uh, these prices have gone even further uh, in the first half of this year. Um, now, the fact that uh, I think there were two things happening, and I already mentioned one of them, that yeah, auction houses were in the past looking at the online sales channel rather as a kind of a supplementary, um, not necessarily where you would put very important uh, works of art, but was more of a kind of a mass market. I think, again, the pandemic forced uh, the auction houses to be more brave uh, when it came to putting uh, online um, or putting objects and uh, works of art onto auction houses of higher value. And I think at the same time, there was definitely this, this notion that people didn't buy art above $5,000 online. I think that's now largely broken. And people, I think, you know, starting to pay on average last year was about $24,000 for a works of art that was sold online through Sotheby's Christmas and Philips, up for about $8,000 the year before. So it's almost tripling in value or what people is prepared for, for, to pay. So confidence is increasing. Confidence is increasing among buyers and confidence is increasing among sellers and being now prepared to create experiences online that are on par and similar to what we would experience in the physical world. So this is what we talk about when we talk about omni-channel experiences is that the consumer chooses which one they think is most appropriate. Sometimes it's a choice that you will buy online and sometimes you want to buy offline. Um, but you expect as a consumer that the quality, whether it's online and offline, will be the same. And I think that's where we are getting to uh, at, you know, today. Um, um, Natalie, I just want to make sure I don't speak too fast for the interpreter. I'm trying to slow down, but uh, is it all okay? Yeah. Uh, yes, everybody is saying. So, понятно, слышно, да? So, хорошо. Everything is perfect. Thank you. Perfect. Great. It's okay. Gone. Excellent. Yes. I can speak much faster uh, if, if, if you want, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to hold it to this. Right. So, Let's uh, look at some of the things that uh, I would say was behavioral changes. So this is coming back to, again, collector, but not only collector behavior, but how things has changed in the art market and also what short and long-term impact these, um, uh, these behavioral changes could have. I think there's a couple of things that's come out of this particular period. And um, this is a, one thing is a kind of the sense of community that has been built, um, particularly uh, within the artist community itself, but also among community of galleries and other people in the art world, coming together in a very difficult time to try to support each other or support, um, you know, finding a platform to be able to reach out to people in a, in a new and a different way. Some of you might have come across this. Um, uh, it started off as an Instagram campaign um, or a hashtag was called Artist Support Pledge. It was basically set up by a UK-based artist. Um, and the purpose was that basically artists could post works and sell works for the maximum price, I think, of about $200 or $250. And every time they sold 
fireworks, they pledged to buy another work by another artist. Um, the last time we looked at it in terms of the number it had raised, it was something like 45 or $50 million had been raised through this particular campaign. Um, and I think, uh, I know myself, having spoken to a lot of artists based here in London, that actually this initiative enabled them to sustain themselves and pay for their studio rent and for all the costs uh, during uh, a period where virtually there was no opportunity to, to work and there was no opportunity to have exhibitions and therefore no sales. Um, I think it's also what it did allow uh, people to do was that it allowed collectors to enter the market at a much cheaper or much more affordable price point than they maybe were accustomed to. So you could buy, a, obviously these were not major paintings, they were works on paper, they were maybe prints, but it allowed people to then discover thousands of thousands of artists that was posting these um, these these images of artworks that they were selling uh, for a modest sum oh. at the same time people felt that when actually by doing that they will they were able to support something though so this whole thing of making an impact and as we will see later on this this uh, motivation for people when they buy art not being purely for personal consumption but also that they feel that the money that they pay for something goes to support an artist or an arts organization is a motivation that is now the second high motivation among collectors. And I think this just tells us that there's also not only a, there's a change in people's reasons for buying art, um, which is also maybe more uh, around philanthropy, more about social impact, more about building community, more about supporting creativity, that has had a very difficult time during this particular pandemic. Uh, the other thing is uh, things like social media. And, and, uh, and I, again, uh, probably doesn't come as a surprise that uh, you know, people are heavily influenced by social media and doesn't matter really what you are, whether you're an influencer or whether you are, you know, if you're not on social media, uh, you, you do miss out. And I think, you know, also within the art world, there's been a heavy adoption of social media, particularly Instagram, as a uh, tool to reach out to consumers in a very cost-effective way that maybe the art world in the past has not been managed to do. Um, but it's not simply uh, using social media as a way of raising awareness or um, you know, inviting people to an event or to kind of... It's also actually now increasingly becoming a... Um, an instrument in itself where people would buy directly through, as we saw with the previous example. So social media, I think it, the Instagram, it kind of turned in from being a, um, a discovery tool, a tool to follow artists, uh, but I think more and more also going to become a commercial vehicle for uh, artists and galleries and operators within the art market to sell directly to consumers. Um, it might not be Instagram. I mean, it could be that something will appear and it's something similar will come up that is more suited to this particular thing. But at the moment, just for the sheer size and the, an enormous amount of, uh, you know, Instagram followers that you can generate, uh, this has become a very, very, very effective channel for the art world and, and cost effective also. This has also mean, you know, in, in terms of we talked about new audiences, um, social media has really been a gate opener for the art world to tap into uh, audiences that had never had anything to do with the with the inner art world. And I think this is also, you know, a, an important part in terms of growing this market going forward. Galleries are changing. Um, I think there's the question today is what does it mean to be a gallery? What does it mean to, uh, what is a gallery model of the future? Is it to have a physical space? Um, what should my online presence be and how should I balance the physical versus uh, online? I think all these things are issues that uh, is, has come to the forefront, particularly during the last 18 months. Uh, what is interesting, like we saw with the artists, and I mentioned this sort of sense of community, uh, we're starting to see the same thing within the gallery world, where the bigger galleries has really been very supportive of smaller galleries that were suffering from the pandemic in terms of not having necessarily the 
technology that enabled them to have a uh, online viewing room or to be able to afford being a present on an online platform. So we have the likes of um, international galleries such as David Schwerner and Hauser and Wirth, Gogosian and others offering their own digital platforms to other galleries around the world. So David Schwerner, as you can see here on the right, um, had something, an initiative they called Platform London. There was a platform Berlin, I think, there was a platform Paris and New York and the, probably others, where the gallery invited smaller, less, um, uh, well, you know, smaller, but also maybe galleries that didn't necessarily have the financial means to build their own uh, digital platforms to come on to their platform and creating almost like a mini a mini fair or mini art fair using uh, their own, using their technology and using also helping in terms of uh, broadening uh, the, the, the uh, access uh, using their collective base. So I, I think going forward, it's going to be very interesting to see whether galleries will maintain the standard uh, way of doing things. Will they participate in art fairs around the world? Um, it's unlikely, you know, that the COVID-19 will go away, you know, just like that. It's probably something we'll have to live with. And I think it's still questionable, what does this mean for the way we as consumers will travel? Do we want to go to fairs around the world every single month? Or are we going to be more selective, more local? And all of these kind of behavioral aspects, which is not necessarily only linked to the art world, but is implicitly linked to the art world, will have an impact on the businesses and the stakeholders and how they operate the business uh, going forward. So galleries is going to be interesting to see whether we have already started to see within the art world a, um, a model around agency, basically uh, where you build up, you, you become an agent rather than a gallerist. But I guess a gallerist is already kind of a type of an agent. Um, but an agent that doesn't necessarily need to have a physical space, but is managing the artist in a slightly different way, managing the artist in the commercial sense, maybe in, with a traditional art market, working with museums and institutions, working in the digital space, uh, maybe with collaborations with brands, etc. So there, there's likely that we might see an emergence of a new type of um, role within the art world when it comes to representation. Uh, what does it mean to represent artists in the 21st century? And I think we are gradually moving away from the traditional physical gallery space, going to art fairs and exhibitions to be much more plural in the way that it um, works with creative talents around the world. And I think you could already see the likes of many of the big talent agencies that typically works with sports people and Hollywood stars and uh, artists, so musicians, et cetera, have already started to work directly with artists in a very similar way. Um, here in London, for example, we have seen a new uh, initiative that opened about a year ago, or was supposed to open a year ago, but was didn't because of the uh, lockdown. Um, but it's a co-working space for galleries. Um, so instead of having a permanent space, you basically have the opportunity to um, have a kind of a, a room, uh, maybe you know, your office, um, and you would have the opportunity to book different spaces across the year, meaning that you can time different exhibitions uh, in different intervals, different spaces, different sizes uh, to fit your need. And this is really mimicking, I guess, the same model that we see in the co-working space in, in, with regards to offices, that businesses can you know, go into a space and have four desks and then suddenly the team expands to 10 and they could just expand it with another four or five desks. Um, and I think this flexibility is a model that I think we might see going forward. And we could start to see these, um, this particular place is called Cromwell Place and it's based in uh, South Kensington in London. Um, but I can see, I think the, the mission is to have a number of these, um, these kind of co-working spaces for galleries and dealers uh, in different parts of the world 
where you can then, obviously, if you were a member of this particular club, you could then have an exhibition in Hong Kong, for example, using the network, using the um, this kind of co-gallery, co-space co as, uh, as a new, new model. So already in a very short space of time, I think we're... These, these models were looking slightly futuristic, but I think they are now becoming very real and very likely that we many will go down this route. Art fairs are probably the, the model that is likely to have to change uh, the most. I mean, I, I think, first of all, art fairs is obviously the whole purpose of an art fair is to be physically there it's um it's not only about seeing and buying art it's the networking it's the social interactions between collectors and curators and galleries and whoever is part of the art world um i think the art press has struggled significantly you know to actually find a mode that can replicate that experience and i think after a while many of you maybe have seen some of the kind of um what they call online viewing rooms, uh, which is, I guess, is a slightly more advanced version than a website, but still very flat compared to what you would expect an art fair to be. As I said, the, the, I would say the, probably the largest aspect or the most important aspect of an art fair is the social, the social interactions, the rumors, the sharing of information. Uh, and it's been very hard. I think no platform yet has managed to recreate or create an alternative experience that is as good as the real thing. I think auction house has been much better. And it's partly just due to the mode of what an auction means. It's often time limited. It's often short. Uh, whilst an art fair typically goes over many days, uh, doesn't create the sort of sense of urgency doesn't create a sense that I need to make a decision right now. Um, so, but I do think we will see, uh, we will see uh, innovation. We will see uh, the number of things happening uh, in this market with regards to what art fairs mean. Uh, I think we will typically in the, in the autumn have hybrid versions of things. We will have live events combined with digital events. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the mode going forward. And actually, if they can create a sort of symbiosis between the two, that the two can work together um, and actually uh, feed of each other, both the live events with the digital event, then I think you can recreate maybe some of those kind of dynamic that we have seen uh, in the auction rooms. Uh, and auctions we have talked about already, but it's, you know, it's been so much change has happened there that it's uh, almost, uh, when I look at an auction house today, it is a very different business than it was only 18 months ago. Uh, in terms of the way they curate the sale, the amount of sales being produced, the type of inventory they do from everything from, you know, skateboards to sneakers to uh, fine art, to manuscripts, NFTs, as we've seen very recently. Um, and it's clearly that the auction houses are changing the way they think about themselves, that fine art is only one aspect of being an auction house. They're really appealing to the broader collecting community to try to be the premium, um, you know, the premium version of these markets across virtually everything. Um, and the way they present things, the way they now execute auctions through sort of kind of edutainment, game show, live stream, shopping channel, you know, sort of, I mean, it's, it has all aspects built into one, has also created a kind of an entirely new dynamic of bidding. And I think has contributed to more competition, higher prices, and ultimately uh, and, and much larger audience base. Some of these auctions are streamed online through uh through through facebook and through uh youtube uh where you can watch these and there are millions of people simply just watching the spectacle and i think you know if you so we're talking about if we want to build the art market and make it bigger and making more people um comfortable and you know trust trusting this marketplace we need to broaden the audience and this is something that the art world has been incredibly uh, bad at doing over the last two decades. Um, and if there's anything that this particular pandemic has allowed us to do is, is, is actually thinking differently uh, and accepting that the old might not be exactly as the new and therefore being able to adapt to the situation, embrace many aspects, as I said, including technology as a, as a, as a tool, as a channel to reach out to new buyers. 
Right. So let's talk a little bit about the buyers because this is also um, something that's changing. Uh, and I, I we, just as I mentioned, the, the market has become bigger. There's more people and there is a number of um, kind of different sort of motivations that are now actually uh, present when it comes to uh, people making a decision regarding buying art. So for example, uh, as we can see here, that the emotional benefit, the passion for art is the by far the most uh, important and has always been, we've done this survey now for 10 years and, and most people buy art because they like art. And I think that's natural. And I think this is the reason why people are sitting here in this room, um, listening to and being part of an, an arts organization and going to exhibitions because you like art. But I think it's interesting also to look at the second important information, uh, important um, motivation, which is uh, this whole thing about social impact, supporting artists and arts organizations, patronage. All these things is now 79% of new buyers and 76% of millennials said that this was an important part. So I think going forward, I hope that almost like we're going towards an art world, which is more... Um, compassionate that it maybe has been in the past in the sense that we are moving towards a world where many of the inequities that has been built up in the art world is just um, is now hopefully might be readdressed by people taking a slightly different approach to why they buy art. I think many of these sort of differences that we've seen in the world at large between rich and poor, those people who have and those people who haven't, it's been replicated in the art world. There are a very few number of artists that um, has virtually everything or, or market that creates everything. And there is a lot of artists that has very little. And I think there is a kind of a responsibility now for the art world to try to rectify these indifferences and these inequalities. And I hope that going forward, actually this attitude that we see today or you, from this survey is not a temporary kind of you know, purely a, a, a result of the COVID pandemic, but actually something that is likely to last. I think the third important um, uh, aspect is the whole thing about value potential. You know, the fact that people are, are associating value with art. It's not, it's not simply the passion and it's not simply the kind of patronage. There's also obviously a uh, financial value attached to this. And this is the reason why a lot of our work, for example, is based around um, how do we protect this value? How do we leverage this value? How do we um, monitor this value? All those things are aspects that it sort of sits within this uh, notion of art and wealth management. Um, now, when people are sort of saying, you know, what, you know, what are the kind of important things when you um, decide to, you know, what is it that drives you to buy from something? I think um, the first point is this whole aspect of quality of art on offer. Um, and I think this is something that I, I mentioned it earlier because there, in the early stages of the online market, the online was seen as a secondary channel. It wasn't seen as something that was a complement to the physical. It was something where you kind of put stuff that you wouldn't otherwise sell in a, uh, in a, in a physical auction. So therefore... Um, in, I think what it says here is that basically people expect both. They expect the same thing in both um, in both channels, in the physical and the offline, online and offline. Is virtually that they expect the quality of um, of the art to be the same. And I think this is where we now, for the first time, we're starting to see the quality in the online space featuring and matching the same as in the physical. The second important thing is transparency and particularly price transparency. And I think this is still an issue that the art world is struggling in trying to find, to communicate pricing. First of all, it's just simply, you know, it's displaying pricing, which is important. Uh, and thirdly, it's understand where did that price come from in the first place? So um, the whole thing here um, is really to, uh, to make sure that how do we create a frictionless journey? How, how do we move from a place where people are virtually in, in every stage of the consumer journey are starting to uh, feel that there is some, some kind of obstacle? Um, so 
quality of art, price transparency, search and nav navigation, all these things are hugely uh, important. Um, so let me just kind of go to the, the, the next stage before we kind of uh, stop and we can uh, talk a little bit about some new models for, of, of, of ownership of art. But I just want to kind of talk a little bit about the, the challenge of how to create a, a frictionless journey. Um, so the whole journey is really about how can I trust the platform itself? How can I trust the sellers on the platform? Um, all these things is, is maybe intuitive. That's something you, you would obviously know, but these things are to communicate trust in the art world is often very difficult. Uh, it's, it's, it's many galleries, many platforms don't have the brand recognition that typically major brands in other parts of the industries have. Um, so how do we create uh, a system that creates this sort of sense of trust for people that are unfamiliar, for example, with an, with an online sales platform? Now, these things could be things like um, trust pilot, you know, customer reviews. But obviously, the art world, I think, is rather uh, cautious about customer reviews because it only takes one negative review to potentially destroy the entire reputation of a gallery. And I think the problem a little bit with the online consumer today is that their expectations are very high. They've been used to uh, the Amazon and fulfillment and pri you know, to, to, to get things within a very short space of time. Um, and it has made it very difficult for the art world to re recreate uh, that kind of fulfillment experience. Um, the other thing is about the representation of art in terms of the, one of the worries that people have is that because they can't see it in a physical nature, how do I know that it looks like what is being presented to me? And this is changing radically because now with the advent of uh, augmented reality, with the advent of better way of visualization of artwork so that in situ, so you could see the artwork on the wall next to a person, so you could see the size and dimension, all these things, has made it better. There is also more information, condition report, provenance history, all these things are now being more and more frequently added to a website so that you're starting to have a better picture of both the actual physical aspect of the artwork um, in, uh, in a visual way, but also then a document that can um, basically state the condition of the artwork in a bit more detail. And again, there are a number of companies out there that are working in this more in the tech space that are looking at uh, finding technical solutions to this. And I think, you know, there's this intersection between uh, blockchain as a registry or as a provenance tracking tool or as a pro provenance tracking registry. Uh, and we, I think within the next two or three years, I think we're gonna start to see uh, massive developments uh, where the intersection between what we've seen in NFTs and blockchain, all these things will now probably come together quite soon to address many of these issues that I just highlighted. Um, the, the, the fourth, uh, uh, third aspect is pricing. Um, you know, as I said, the, one of the biggest things was valuation and transparency um, and transparency in pricing. Uh, we already hear seeing uh, new tools coming to the market uh, regarding um, how do I know that I'm paying a fair price? First of all, what is a fair price? But at the moment, the art world, particularly within the online space, are, are really quite uh, spares when it comes to communicating value beyond just the price. You know, there's very rarely that you will find comparable pricing tools, etc. So there's at least a number of uh, technology companies that are being coming up in the last, uh, well, 12 to 18 months that are actually looking at this particular uh, aspect of helping people regarding the pricing aspect. And as soon as we have these components embedded into one structure, then I think you know, this friction that we have seen is started to gonna be lower and lower and making it much, the, the trust around this, this process will, will start to build up. Um, so the transaction and the fulfillment, obviously this is sort of um, the, the thing of can I return an artwork? I mean, I think this is sort of, uh, it's not something one normally do when one runs a gallery, is being able to have a return policy. Unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on which side you're on, but it's um, now basically uh, under European law, uh, you will have 15 days to be able to return an artwork with no questions asked. 
Um, the way that the platform is trying to mitigate that is by obviously adding shipping cost if you intend to do that. And shipping and transport is obviously expensive, so that might prevent people from returning works in the first place. But I think also what, we, what we've seen among some of the platforms very recently is that saying we will make the return policy uh, very attractive. We will pay for the shipment. We will make sure that if they don't like the work, they can just return at no cost with no questions asked. Um, and I think if you if you think, well, that you might sort of say, well, that's actually, how can that be a profitable business? But many of these platforms has increased their both their revenue and client base significantly as a result. It's basically made uh, people more, feeling more trust in that transaction at the same time as they have been giving more information in order to ensure that um, the customer has, you know, as both the visual information as much as, as possible and other things in order to prevent them from coming back and returning it. So sometimes these policies can be used proactively to kind of create an atmosphere of trust, which allows people uh, hopefully to take an, an, an action and, and buy a work. So these are standard practices in any e-commerce around the world. The art world, as I said, it's just lagging a little bit behind what we're used to. And I think there will, it's just a question of time before these things will happen. And when that happens, I think we're going to start to see a much, much potentially bigger, bigger marketplace, more new audiences, um, and a um, uh, and and hopefully something that will benefit also creatives and and other stakeholders in the art market. So I'll I know we're sort of rough coming towards uh, um, about an hour, and I want to make sure, uh, Natalie, that we we have some time for questions. I just want to kind of quickly do um, talking about the aspect of art as an asset class and this whole aspect between art and wealth. Um, and this is the kind of project we've been working on with Deloitte now for many years. Um, and it's really kind of four pillars. It's um, the what we call the accumulation side, which is really more the investment aspect of accumulating wealth. The other one is protecting, uh, the protecting the wealth that's being created in, in an art-related wealth. Um, the Fourth or third thing is converting this wealth into something else. And this is what we call art secured lending, which is very similar to that. You will take out the mortgage on a house and uh, use that money for something else. Um, and we're starting to see a number of financial institutions around the world offering these services to the collectors where the artworks can be used as a security for a loan and they could use the loan then for other purposes, whether that's buying more art to refinance an existing loan or to invest in other businesses, whatever it is. But for the first time, it's really over the last five, six years, there's a whole economy now being built around that art is an asset class and can operate in many, many ways as a very similar thing that we can see, for example, with, as with, with property. And the fourth thing is really about this massive transfer of wealth that we are currently going through between the baby boomer generation and the next generation. And many of these uh, older generation have built up substantial collections and are looking at ways of thinking about what we're going to do with this legacy. Are we going to sell it? Are we going to set up a foundation? Are we going to give it to our children? What about if the children doesn't want it? All these things are issues that's is coming up. And all these things are uh, aspects that the wealth manager would typically deal with day to day. The only difference is that it didn't used to be art in there. Art was the kind of the new, um, the new aspect within this uh, ecosystem. And this is the, what we've been monitoring for the last 10 years, is that we are starting to see private banks and family offices building up services around accumulating, protecting, converting, and transferring art-related wealth. So that's another kind of, um, I would say, a change uh, with regards to ownership. It's not simply, the ownership is not sim simply having it on the wall and enjoying it. There's also other aspects that you could use this object for, which is now becoming much more financial in nature. I want to look a little bit about, just very quickly, about what does ownership mean today? And I think this is, we are moving towards a world where ownership of the physical object is not necessarily the only, the only possibility. Um, 
And this whole aspect of fractional ownership, basically that uh, a, an object can be owned by multiple uh, individuals, um, very similar to a, a company that is basically where investors will own shares, um, is something that is now also becoming quite, um, I would say, popular um, in the recent, particularly the last recent 12 months. Uh, again, I don't know if the um, the pandemic was in a kind of a, a catalyst for this change or whether this just something else happening in society, which basically attracts people who doesn't necessarily need to own the physical object, but want to be part of the journey of that physical, physical object in a, in a kind of a financial sense. And there's a number of platforms out there. Um, there's one which is called Otis, uh, which is a uh, American company. Uh, it might be Canadian, actually, Canadian or American, um, that uh, operates in fractional ownership um, platform where you're allowed to buy into uh, different type of collectibles. Uh, what you see here on this image is a, a, a sneaker, it's a 1985 Air Jordan 1, um, which normally would sell probably around $30,000. Um, instead, what you could do is that you can buy yourself a share for maybe $5.00. Uh, to be a part owner in these sneakers. And the sneaker market is basically massive. Um, this is, again, one of those markets that the auction houses like Solibus and Christie's and Philips has entered into because they realize the type of demographics and type of audiences that are associated with these collectible markets is something that is just representing this new generation of potential collectors that they would like to cultivate and engage with. Um, so, the, so the, the whole aspect here is really to think about culture and art as a new asset. Uh, it's about, demo, they call it democratization of the art investment market, the giving people access to something that maybe will cost millions, you can now get access to by being a part owner of it. Um, for many people who are in the art world would say, why would I do that? I mean, why, you know, the whole purpose of art is to, to kind of view it, to be, to be in front of it, to, to, to you know, I don't know, to, to, to have some kind of almost kind of physical um, experience of the artwork. Uh, that, that seemed to be kind of stripped away. Um, and to a certain extent, that is true. What many of these platforms are doing, though, is that they are rec they're recreating this whole thing of concept of ownership from being owning of something physical to be owning some kind of experience. Part of that experience might be a financial experience in the sense that you see the value and of your object going up in value and you could sell it for a higher price. The other thing is almost like a club. It, you're, being, you're using the club membership as a way of educating yourself about the collectible that you might not know much about. So instead of taking the risk of buying these uh, sneakers for $30,000, for a fiver, you will be introduced into the club, learn about the sneaker market, and then maybe later on venture out to do something different. So I think the important thing of these many of these platforms is that they're not there to replace the traditional ownership models, but they are acting as new platforms of inviting new people that otherwise might not even, uh, you know, would never buy a work of art um, and are now feeling that this model provides them with an alternative channel, with an alternative route into the market. There is another platform called masterworks.io, which is very much, uh, much more focusing on fine art uh, and contemporary art and modern art, um, and, but operates in a very similar way basically where people are buying shares in individual paintings. Um, this, both these platforms, and I think this is important to mention, are regulated platforms. These are just, they're not sort of schemes that just someone has set up. Both are regulated by the uh, SEC, which is the Securities and Exchange Commission in the United States. And every single artwork is listed as a um, specific um, financial, um, uh, it, it has, it's basically a, a regulated object, a regulated financial investment. So I guess it's interesting now is that we are, we, the ownership has changed in many ways. It's changed because it, it, these new technology is allowing us to think about ownership in a slightly different way. And I think it's also, there's a, um, uh, an, 
I guess it's a generational thing. A lot of people these days do not necessarily want to own a car. They do not necessarily want to own a flat. They may be flat sharing. There might be many other things that just don't think this baggage of ownership of physical things is not that attractive. Um, so I think these models are also coming up and not purely from an kind of investment point of view, but also that ownership in the future might mean something different. And I think this is where the NFTs, just to kind of end off with this, is really um, kind of change the notion of uh, ownership in many ways. No ocean, the notion of ownership regarding digital art. Um, I think you know, that you know the opportunities that a digital art market was often a very limited commercial market um, because collectors really didn't feel, I guess, confident in what they owned and how would that you know how we, and and also that there was no market really around these um these digital artworks obviously the whole nft market has changed that uh, and it's uh built a new a new ecosystem around digital collectibles whether it's sort of art in the traditional sense or whether we are talking about uh, music or whether we're talking about games or we're talking about memes or we're talking about, you know, baseball cards or baseball uh, basketball cards, all these things are, you know, it, NFTs is just representing the possibility um, for uh, people to transact these digital collectibles in a secure um, in a secure way, but also creating a marketplace that also might benefit the creators of it. So something very beautiful within this NFT structure is that through the smart contracts, they are allowing obviously um, the artists themselves, the creator to benefit also from secondary sales in the sense that there's, you will get money when you sell something, but you also get repeat sales, kind of royalties. Um, so I think... So what we're seeing right now with NFTs, I think we're just in the very beginning of something uh, that is a little bit difficult to see exactly where we're heading. Uh, the art, the, the market, we, we, we launched a report in May, as I showed you uh, very early on in the presentation today. Um, we had this crazy period during March, which was the $69 million people that sold at Christie's. The market has calmed down significantly since then in the kind of more fine art, fine art space. Um, but I do think, uh, in a sense, it's open up the dialogue to think about what, for example, could the link between the physical art and NFT be in the future? Could NFT become the certificate of ownership for a physical artwork? And all those things are things I mentioned in this journey of frictions of, of that consumers are often facing when they buy art online. Maybe NFTs... And maybe the technology behind NFT will become a solution to many of these, these, these problems. So I think, uh, I mean, again, as I said probably many times now, the amount of innovation, the amount of change that has happened in 18 months is just extraordinary. And I think we are at the cusp of basically seeing a very different marketplace. And that is not to say that artists will be there. All, all of the, the existing things will exist, but the way art is finding itself to the market will change and is already changing, which means that all of us who are operating around the art, not the artists themselves, but the around the art in terms of servicing the art, in terms of providing uh, uh, products and, 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 and other things, we need to adapt to this new and changing environment. Um, Natalie, I, I probably run over 10 minutes and I, I will stop here because I think that, um, um, yes, I, otherwise, we'll we have no time for any questions. So, uh, we still have a couple questions. I'm going to 20 minutes still hours, you know, and then have the first time to ask the first question. Actually, uh, you know, it, it was an amazing presentation. We like give uh, a notion of what's going on in the world. And uh, actually, I have an intuition, and I also know notice that you know wealth is going from you know old generation to millennial uh, millennials younger we have uh, very many young uh, rich people up to 25 for instance some of them are crypto you know wealthy people so and uh, some of them reach just like the uh, uh, knowledge of the spirit part, or just you know, some cultural background, which we think we should uh, 
uh, learn somehow during our life, and uh, uh, that means that the values are absolutely different. And somehow I have a feeling that you know these traditional collections which we have at now in the museums, uh, you know the art, uh, the material art, they won't be interesting for them anymore. And this may influence the value of these collections, maybe in the future. What do you think? What will be uh, the share maybe? Or maybe the share will change of new digital art and traditional values, taking into account that the new generation is uh, very rapidly going um, digital world. Um, okay, not that it was a little bit difficult to hear because of the microphone and the echo. Um, but I, so, so basically, you, you were um, you were talking about the kind of the the digital versus physical art, and to what extent will maybe one take over the other, particularly in regards to generation. Um, I, I do think. I mean, I I think these two worlds will coexist. I, I don't think. I mean, if anything, I think the digital might even. Um, it might even um, increase interest in the physical, in the sense that the, the digital becomes a gateway to that physical object. Um, I, I, I think that, yes, you, you're, I think there is among a certain generation, I mean, I can, sometimes I, I, I test this on my 15 year old son to see, you know, do you like this? And he said, yeah, this is great. Um, and that, for example, is a digital work of art that he can have on his phone. And I said, wouldn't you like to have Kind of art on the wall and he just absolutely has no interest uh in that but i think that's maybe a 16 year old um he, maybe when he's 25 he might change his mind I do, so i think some of these things there are a, a, depending on what stage you are in your life i think you know there will be and which generation you belong to um that i, th I think first of all the digital art forms will expand and that's we're going to see an enormous growth. But I don't think the other. I think the other world will. Um, I think it will remain. And I think, in a sense, one will enhance the other. I think one will bring attention to the physical. I think there's something. I don't know. There's something very special about the physicality of, I guess, any object. And I. I I mean, obviously I'm sitting in slightly the wrong generation trying to make these these kind of statements because I, I still I, I love many digital art forms and I, I really um, everything from animation to that I that I you know I, I really really enjoy it and I really like it but I still think um, that it's not an either or and, and I don't think one will necessarily encroach on the other I just think that these the world of digital collectibles will be an enorm there will be an enormous expansion there um and it's you know very easy to think about art in this sense but obviously there are other um there are other taking the gaming industry for example where there's a massive opportunity for people that already are buying things but cannot sell it but if you could now suddenly buy things and sell it within that community then obviously there's a you know huge marketplace there um I, I think the I think the digital again will will hopefully the impact it will have on the traditional art market is that we will expose the traditional art world to a new type of audiences that maybe initially don't have that interest. But if you know, we, there's a reason why the likes of Pace Gallery, for example, the major you know London New York based gallery, where is now launching their NFT kind of part of their business. Because I think everyone or everyone in the art world is keen on engaging with that with this with this group of people that I don't think they've ever spoken to before. Um, and I, and I, 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 I expect that when they draw these people's attention, uh, both to the digital as well as the physical, I think, you know, we, th that's where I think it might, it might actually, the, the, the growth of the digital ultimately will benefit also the physical. And I think we will see, um, you know, hopefully actually a, a a, 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 you know, a, a parallel growth rather than one cannibalizing the other. I guess, in other words, we will understand the value of the digital world with the help of digital. I have a possibility to give questions from uh, our guests, from our audience. Please, 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 please,
Запрошую задати нашому гостю, нашому спікеру. У кого є питання? Можете підійти, давайте, можете намінитися. So, I give you the space for... Та-та, я вам буду переводити. Якщо все-таки це проблема мистецтва стає все більше, ніж фізичного, то чи є якась перспектива, можливо, чи можливість створення цілих маркетплейсів на мистецтві? So the question is, if the digital wealth is becoming, you know, is growing, does that mean that we will have more and more marketplaces? More, more marketplaces. Yes. Yeah. Um, I think uh, what we're seeing now is that there might be actually consolidation in these. Um, we, on, on one hand, we have seen more and more marketplaces, particularly. Um, well, so there are two things. There's the online market dealing with online traditional art, um, but I think the, the number of marketplaces has kind of uh, leveled out over the last four or five years. And actually, we now, this year, saw one of the biggest um, auction platforms, an online auction aggregator, buying the other second biggest auction aggregator. Uh, and I think we probably come to a point where rather than seeing an enormous amount of new platforms coming, is that the traditional art world, I think, will start to consolidate around fewer platforms. And I think the, there, will, there might be some global platforms, maybe like Artsy and a few others that might sort of survive. And then there probably will be some strong um, local, national platforms that cater for artists in that specific, uh, but not necessarily an international audience. Um, but I do think, I'm not sure if we're going to see an enormous amount of growth in the platforms. Where I think we're going to see growth is, um, what, what we have seen growth in is, is in the NFT space. Um, but I think that's also might likely to consolidate at some point. Um, I think the art world might come up with its own version. At the moment, it's very much around uh, Nifty Gateway, Super Rare, Rarible, and a few others. Um, and they're kind of mixing a lot of things there because there's often music and there is a uh, game and there is things that is not sort of, I think the art world is struggling a little bit with the aesthetic of some of these things and say, you know, that is not on the same way, wavelength in the sense that they, it's not what they would perceive as quality. And therefore, I think, you know, what Pace is doing and what maybe others are doing is that I think we're going to start to see curated platforms around artists that works within the digital you know, digital space within the traditional world, finding their own platform. I think that's just where there's going to be many, probably initially there might be many because everyone wants to kind of get onto it and then maybe it will consolidate into to, 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 to fewer. So in the online online space of selling traditional art, physical artworks, but through an online platform, I think that 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 market will consolidate. That will become smaller, Sm smaller, meaning fewer number of players because it is becoming more competitive. If you if you have the uh, the bandwidth and the strength to kind of get out there, then you're likely to get most of the client. And it's a little bit size matters because it really uh, the, the capital and and the technology and the cost of technology is high. So unless you you know manage to get their audiences, then it's going to be tough to kind of uh, survive in the long run. Um, and and on the NFT side, as, as I said, I think we're going to see a spur of growth and initiatives uh, that probably going to last a few years and then maybe again some cons consolidation in that space but that's that's great i mean I, I that's not bad thing that's that we need that that's the kind of essential for we need to invest in infrastructure we need to have people who take risks and are willing to fail I and mean, that's the only way this market can go going forward so um so i think i see that what was happening now as a as a really positive and um development to, to to bring the art world and the art market to a different level than we we've been in the past thank you thank you more questions please come so you see <laughs> Hello, um, I have a question. In one of the graphs, you mentioned that um, the general sales were rising about online only sales in 2020, but average prices lowered. So, what was the reason? Uh, the average price is lowered because of 
um, new artists appearing on the market or because old painters lowered their prices. Or maybe even more, we go further and we say that this tendency will end and this Salvatore Mundi record would never be beaten. So what do you think about that? Thank you. But the reason of lowering the average prices is the most interesting. Do you remember which um, graph that was? Was that the graph? Uh... Uh, yeah, it was uh, uh, online on the sales in 2020, and you showed the difference between general sales, they were rising, but average prices uh, were lowering. Okay. Okay. So, so um, it's a little bit uh, the, the graph itself. Um, uh, it, it was taken over, so this is the 219, um, I guess the 219 figure just shows the, um, the 221, no, sorry, 2020 figure was showing the overall total sales of online. The, the average price was kind of declining, but it was a little bit because it was done over a monthly basis. So it, it was showing uh, month on month um, the average price in each category up until August. Unfortunately, August is a month where not much is happening and therefore it was few sales, although there was a few. So that is actually was just a representation of not the aggregate rise in price because actually the rise in average price went up from about $8,000 to $24,000. It's just that the graph was done on a, I would say, you know, a, a, a monthly basis, looking like it's a decline in that final month, but it's actually because of the type of work that was sold in that month. But so coming back to the, what might what is happening with the online i think um it's um well first of all as, as i mentioned confidence in um selling higher value works is increasing and i think that is just um a, a mix of auction houses being prepared to show higher quality works online because they know that buyers are now willing to pay it and these are kind of it's a cyclic, cyclical argument which ultimately if you manage to do that then you know, confidence increasing. Um, eh, regarding Salvador Mundi and the 450 million, whether we're going to see anything like this again, I, I, I think so. Um, we might not see that work eh, being sold again, ever again for any price like that, but, but something similar is likely to happen. I think, the, I think even the 69 billion dollar, oh, sorry, million dollar, um, Beeple is a, you know it's also quite extraordinary an artwork that with you know even six months before that wasn't it wouldn't even probably be recognized as an artwork by Christus and Sotheby's and then suddenly finding itself to be you know among the most expensive artworks in you know let's say among the top hundred expensive artworks in the world ever sold I mean and I think that's an extraordinary thing uh, without having necessarily even being tested as a, as a medium so these things will happen and it happens when there is obviously a lot of people with an enormous amount of wealth um in this case of crypto related wealth where people are spending it on on things because there may be nowhere else to spend it um so it's a kind of the part of the art market which which is often hard to understand and, and it's often irrational and i think there's a lot of irrationality when people pay these prices but it's obviously it's, it's, it's irrationality combined with someone who has so much money that it actually is a, probably a drop in the ocean anyway. And that's, I think it's likely to continue. I don't think that's going to, that, that phenomenon is, is not going to go away. If anything, it might be even stronger uh, going forward, um, which I'm not thinking is not necessarily a sort of the prettiest thing about the art market. It's not, not those aspects I enjoy most because I think, you know, those, those prices means very little to most people and that can actually benefit many. If you think about 450 million spent on a, on a, on a work of art, I mean, the number of arts organizations around the world that could have benefited from 450 million in funding is enormous and I think could have a much better and, and more important impact than just paying these amount of monies. But that's, that's also why I mentioned earlier this, distortion in the in the art market these inequalities that we see and these pricing that we see for certain artists versus others is you know problematic and and something that um you know i hope might be addressed in the future by actually that someone feels the responsibility that some of that money might go to somewhere else and i think again coming back to nfts um 
this this distribution mechanism that exists within NFTs and the fact that the artist gets royalties um, or in the future that the buyer can, for example, say 10% of this price will I will donate to a certain charity or something I support. All of these things can be done in the future as a fundraising tool. So that I, I'm hopeful, again, that maybe technology will enable us to rectify some of these things. I, I don't think I completely answered your, your question, but the, the graph is, is unfortunately kind of lying a little bit. We're not lying, but it's but it, it's it's uh, misrepresenting in the sense that there, there was actually a, a, a tripling in in rise in average price if you looked up on a year by year basis, but um, uh, which is in line with the with with uh, the increase in sales. Um, and I think this this what we showed this year is that that this has continued. Uh, the market has gone even the, fir- the next six the the first six months of this year is, is continued uh, not in the same growth rate but in a, in a similar fashion. Uh, thank you, Anders. Uh, uh, I have a question. Ah, so we have a question in chat, by the way, from Alistair. Yeah? Just a minute. We have a question in chat. Ah, so it's from Alistair Hicks. You know, he will be participating tomorrow. It's, uh, so this is the question. Do you think the changes in the balanced physical digital market will decrease or increase the dominance of the Americans on the international market? Я можу перевести, Андрес, а я думаю, чи зношення фізичного та світового мистецтва зніжить чи зменшить домінантну позицію американців в міжнародному арфі? I was translating under so your answer please. Yeah, it's a, it's a good it's a good question. Um and I'm, I'm, I I think at the moment um well, I think this is probably something that in, well, if we look at our time period, well, um, uh, will might be changing. But right right now, I think uh, it is likely to increase, I would say, the, the, the dominance of the American market. And I just looked at a very interesting um, statistics today, um, which shows that um, U.S., has something like 80% of Bitcoin ATMs in the world, um, which just shows that the infrastructure around the whole thing about NFTs linked with cryptos is, is much more developed than any other parts of the world. <clears throat> um, so I think until the world is a little bit like electric, electrical cars, unless you're starting to have charging points, um, you know, few people will buy electrical cars. And there's a little bit in this world as well. It's the link between the infrastructure, uh, the link between the regulatory aspects around cryptocurrencies, et cetera. Um, it's, uh, it's likely, I would say, that US will be a dominant force. But obviously, it's quite interesting to see that many of the sort of the top buyers in this NFT world has really come out of Asia, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, and, and China. Um, it's difficult to know whether that's just the kind of trophy buying by a few people or whether the actual depth of the um of the buyer base you know is is as deep as it might suggest or whether we're just seeing part of the surface but so so in the in the short term i feel that in, if anything the sort of physical digital actually probably might increase uh, the dominance of the Americans, but you know, maybe over time uh, it might might balance out a bit by maybe more presence from Asia. And it's interesting to see, just as I said, in a very short space of time, how Hong Kong has really um, you know taken taken over London as the second most important market for the three auction houses. Um, and you know, the auction houses are moving staff uh, to Hong Kong. Uh, there's clearly kind of a uh, an investment both in um, both in 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 in, in ex, you know ex, ex, I guess experienced personnel or people with the the um, with the knowledge. Um, so so I, I I think there might be sort of a yeah. So going I think Americans initially then maybe there will be a shift. But I I I I think a lot of the things that we've seen already will be in a sense mimicked in this world uh, that we that's already present. 
Uh, under do you have an information your auction houses these three major auction houses do they accept cryptocurrency for traditional art or no yes, yes. so so well did they start it now to accept cryptocurrencies um yeah and and also for uh, for traditional art And uh, one more question, uh, I guess this will be the last question. We already have some private collections and institutions who are making NFT based on their collections. So um, uh, uh, the reason uh, is uh, they try to raise money for the institutions to uh, attract more people. Uh, do you hear me? Do you hear me? Something wrong is... Uh, do you hear me? No? Sorry, yeah. Yeah, uh, oh, okay. So uh, the reason is that I raise more money and to involve people into, you know, into supporting all the institutions. But actually the owners of this art are this institution. So as we told that uh, uh, actual people who are buying NFT from the museum or from uh, the private collection, they get a share of uh, some piece of art or the collection. So what do you think will um, motivate people to buy shared NFT of the institution? I think, so I think um, I mean, this is an interesting thing about NFT and the, or, or tokenization, which is the kind of the slightly broader term, and NFT is a sort of a subfield of tokenization, but is, um, as it, so from the institutions, as I see, you know, obviously this could potentially be effective fundraising tool as a way of, you know, maintaining the artwork in the collection, but um, selling, I guess, a kind of certain rights to that artwork uh, through a form of tokenization. And I think the, the, the question is, you know, a little bit, what are you selling? You know, what rights are you selling? And I think, you know, maybe one can start to think about these things as, memberships you know in a sense as you know access in a sense the work is in the museum and by you owning an nft or some kind of token linked to that artwork which you have paid for that you maybe can trade with others because people also want but that gives you exclusivity to maybe certain type of aspects like privileged access to the work talking to the curator meeting other people that is also it's almost like you're adopting an artwork you know it's almost like you are um, a patron but you're not the only patron you are many patrons that are supporting maybe the acquisition of the artwork maintenance of the artwork research into maybe it's an old master and they there's um, research into the provenance history maybe it's almost like you are the NFT and the ownership, it's the right to participate in the journey of the painting or journey, the experience of the painting. I think that's where it's not necessarily buying and selling the actual, you know, the work. It's not investment value. It's almost, I see this more as a tool to, if you think about an almost like a kind of a museum membership, but in a, you know, in a, in a new version, instead of selling a membership where people get access to, uh, to, um, to a museum and enter and, you're now getting access to something else, which is linked to a specific object, which which I think can maybe uh, you, you be palatable within uh, within the in the institutional world. Because I think the problem is this: when it becomes speculative and investment around it, and obviously that that is problematic. But if if we can start to think about maybe NFTs or tokens as um, giving you providing you access to um, to, to the institution and the work and everything around it, but very specifically that you could choose what you want. So, you know, you might be interested in a very specific work in, I don't know, in the, in, in the uh, National Gallery here in London. And therefore you are almost, got, you, you know, you're buying a token on that work, which then gives you access to X, Y, Z. I don't know what those things are, but that those could be embedded into the kind of the contract of, 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 of the token. So I, I, I think... I'm not sure this, this is going to happen at the lightning speed. I think this, if there's any sector that might take a while to do so, but I do think there's a really interesting potentially uh, overlap between this technology that's now emerging and potentially the public sector, both as an engagement audience tool, but also as a potential fundraising tool to maintain support uh, restore whatever you know something that's in the collection so it's almost a kind of a, a mix between crowdfunding for you know helping an artwork needed needing repairs but but you're doing it through a different type of vehicle 
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, others, that was fascinating. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, we already took over time and, uh, and the time is finished. But uh, uh, yeah, it was really exciting. We got a lot of information which we need to think over uh, based on your presentation. Thank you very much. And we have a short break and go to our table uh, dedicated to end. Uh, and uh, I wish you a good day, of course, and uh, uh, I hope that sooner or later we will see each other on some of the arguments in the world. Thank you again for participating in the next meeting of Forum, and we will have the record, and we will share, if you allow, of course, the link, I guess you do, with uh, our audience and with our guests and with our followers of the team. And I hope uh, this will be very useful information for Ukrainian part of it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you much, everyone. Thanks for the questions and your your patience sitting here an hour and a half listening to me. But um, it, was, uh, it was a real pleasure to be part of it. So good luck with the rest of, rest of the forum. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you.